Um, my name is Dave DeMello. I run our global business consulting team. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here today. It's very important to us. And thank you for your ongoing support as uh, customers and uh, interest in our company. Um, we're working hard for you, trust us. Uh, OK, so when, uh, as part of our, our consulting team, we work with all of our, what we call our high-end companies, uh, customers like Trimble, like Juniper, and so forth. So what I like to do is try to tie a few of the things that you heard this morning back into a real-life example. Thanks for the feedback. Um, and, uh, but when we engage with, with companies like, like many of yours, their problems usually fall into three categories, right? It's go to market, you're from Juniper today, we're working with them to try to help them realize a renewed um, uh, subscription business, uh, usage-based licensing, you're from Trimble, how we're working with them on their SaaS model. Um, so it's go to market, uh, ease of fulfillment, who has ease of fulfillment problems in the area of license management? There, I'm sure there would be plenty of hands, um, right? Uh, and we're working with Trimble, another good example. I love my calls with Bill Graver from Trimble. As you can tell, they're as equally entertaining as they are rewarding. Um, great customer to deal with. But we're working with them on, on ways that um, they can move software licenses through their, their distribution network, right? Through their channels and channel partners and their, their dealers and so forth. And then uh, the last is customer insight, right? Is helping customers pretty easily and quickly figure out what's installed, what's shelf where, where it's installed, um, and so forth. So those problems tend to have uh, profound impact on the business in two areas. It's really expensive to operate that way, right? If you can't go to market, being able to um, offer uh, solutions in the way your customers want to consume them, the way you want to um, uh, monetize on them, there are lost opportunities. You know, manual processes of license fulfillment is really expensive. Many of you, I'm sure, understand that. Um, you know, headcount, revenue recognition issues, you're going to see some of those today. Uh, and then, um, you know, finally, there's another one in there on my notes. <laughs> <laughs> really not on my slide. Um, but anyway, um, uh, customer satisfaction is all wrapped up in, in all of that, right? It's, if you have processes that are slow, disparate, you know, you end up with a poor customer experience and, and all that stuff is really costly. So um, those problems are certainly not new and they're not unique and they're not unique. Uh, we're not immune to them here at Jamalto. So uh, I'd like to introduce Vicki White. Like uh, Ariella said, she's our director of... Um, of virtual products in our operations team. And uh, this is our story. Thanks, Dave. You guys hear me OK? OK. Yeah, so a year ago, I was sitting out in the audience here, as many of you are, as kind of an internal customer to the software monetization group um, coming from the data protection side of the business. So um, as you guys know, and many of our companies grew through acquisition, much as Jamalto did. So what we saw is there are a lot of pockets, right? Um, things that were inherited from acquisition and, and maybe not consistency throughout all the different um, groups. So while we have a lot of expertise in-house, maybe that expertise was not you know, spread um, uniformly across the organization. So we went uh, to fix that. So today, the agenda is we're gonna talk a little bit about yesterday, where we came from, what the situation was like before, today, you know, where we are, how we've gone about improving that, and then tomorrow, where, what's still left to be done. So I hope that what you'll take away is that you know, there's some success in here. Absolutely, I hope you think of this as a success story, but also realize it's a journey that's continuing. We're not done yet. Maybe next year I'll be back again to talk about what else we've done. OK, so yesterday, again, putting it out there, right? Uh, although Jamalto was hosting this, um, we do have our own dirty laundry. We have messes inside to clean up. So if you were to say, what is Jamalto? We're a market leader in licensing and entitlement management solutions, absolutely. Um, we're also a typical company that faces typical challenges. So multiple choice, correct answer, C, both. We have legacy product designs that we've inherited through acquisition, legacy homegrown systems, a whole bunch of them, um, a lot of manual processes and not automation, and um, the human tendency to kind of keep doing what, you're all, what you've always done. So these acquisitions come on and you know, this group has done this forever and this group has done that forever and it takes a lot of effort to reverse that inertia. So we do have our own, uh, we have our own dirty laundry that we're looking to clean up. 
Also, like many of you, we've been transitioning from hardware, more of a hardware company, to a, a software license virtual delivery type company. And when contrasting both of those, we've seen you know, clear differences. Uh, a lot of confusion with virtual in terms of, and I'm speaking mostly from an operational standpoint, um, within operations, when we talk about hardware, a lot of people involved with supply chain and, and you know, vendor relationships, and everyone knows their job, everyone knows how to deliver hardware. As we've shifted toward delivering virtual products, uh, not so clear. A lot of people are looking at this, well, I don't know even, what am I delivering? And it, because it's different from one product family to another, a lot of internal stakeholders are confused. I don't even know how I'm supposed to deliver this. How are we going to close this line in our ERP system, and how are we going to recognize re revenue? Um, also, as the product teams are designing these products, again, historically, when they're designing hardware, there's this assumed level of complexity. A product team historically wouldn't think of trying to launch a new product without talking to operations and getting them involved early. But with virtual, we've seen cases where the R&D team, the product teams are designing things and then literally just before launch, trying to hand it off to operations to say, you figure out how to deliver this. And it's been, quite honestly, it's been a bit, a bit messy. And with the recognition of that, we said, you know, we need to do something to change. Um, so I think I've covered everything on there. Uh, chaotic handoffs, lack of clear ownership, manual processes, inconsistent customer experience. That goes for external as well as internal customers. Um, this slide is to depict uh, just a few samples of various uh, products, software and licensing products, and where they fall on that uh, continuum of security versus efficiency. So typically we've seen an inverse relationship where if you've got high security and you're trying to really lock things down and recognize or and capture revenue, that a lot of times mean lower efficiency or friction for the customer versus the other side, okay, I'm gonna make it easy for the customer to use, uh, but then you may have some revenue leakage. Where we wanna be is in that upper right quadrant where you have a situation where customers can easily use the product, but we're also not losing revenue. So we are, we've seen examples, uh, legacy, you know, SafeNet, legacy Jamalto that are all over that, that map, if you will. And then from a back office standpoint, um, this is not a full rendition by any means, but the, the main message here is that we have a single ERP system, we happen to run Oracle, and we have a whole bunch of systems, of back office systems. Somebody, one of the other presenters mentioned 20-something or 30-something key generators. I don't know what our count is, but there's a lot. Um, a lot of back office systems that we've inherited and we've just not phased out. So we have some level of automation, or we had gotten to the point where we have some automation between our ERP system and our back office systems, but a lot more were fully manual, where we have people, either in customer service or order fulfillment, that are you know, booking an order in our ERP system and then turning around and doing manual steps in a variety of other back office systems. It's not efficient, not scalable, and causes a lot of confusion. Okay, so there's a few just kind of pictorial um, depictions of a day in the life. Again, this is all yesterday, right? So not trying to paint an ugly picture, but customer service representatives, you know, getting a call, trying to book an order, and really thinking, great, I have no idea how I'm going to book this, because there are so many different products and, and ways that we sell our products. So our own internal folks have confusion. Similarly, a fulfillment staff member trying to fulfill a simple software or license order finds himself or herself often quite confused. I'm not even sure how I'm supposed to fulfill this. And lastly, and most sadly, in the past we've seen customers frustrated. You know, you're telling me I'm going to get my software and my license next week. How is that in today's day and age? Not, not a good situation. So unhappy customers internally and externally. Oh, we have a question at this point. Question. Yay, the polling question. And everybody can see it. All right, so which of these areas represents your biggest operational challenge? NPI, order booking, fulfillment, or customer experience? It should be interesting. Ooh. UX rules. Mm -hmm. And fulfillment. Yeah. Any surprises? No, uh, we, I would say NPI was probably the biggest pain point and customer experience, yep. Okay. 
Great. Okay, so moving on to today, um, just again, fast forward, a lot of what we just heard is, is you know, legacy problems, not to say that we're absolved of all of them, but I wanted to talk a little bit more on a positive note of what have we done to fix some of this stuff. Um, so we at some point said, laundry day, time to clean up the dirty laundry. We went around talking with customers, internal and external, and the, some of the things we heard, one, we don't want you to ship us software on DVDs anymore for the most part, with some exceptions. Government customers were an exception, but for the most part, I want to download electronic. I want, I want things delivered to me virtually. Uh, I want shorter lead times, pretty much instantaneous delivery. Um, internal cu internal yeah, customers and stakeholders saying, I need some back office automation. We can't keep throwing more and more headcount as our, as our revenue and our products grow. And then, of course, underlying all that, we need security, secure delivery. So with this feedback, we said, let's utilize our own expertise. We have a software monetization group that utilizes this. Let's make sure that we're using this everywhere. Um, so let's leverage that. And the approach we took was to start with a few legacy products. Let's experiment with those. Let's see how it goes, and then scale up from there. From there. So here's the case study I'm going to take you through. This is a case study of a product called SMC. It's a software-only product that's used to um, manage high-speed high encryptors. So the high-speed encryptors themselves are hardware items. This is a software management console that kind of sits up on top of those and helps administrators um, to manage those high-speed encryptors. Um, and there's a software component and then a licensing component which enables features and functions. A quick um, diagram of how the process worked before. First, the customer would submit a PO to us. It would be booked in our Oracle ERP system as a sales order. And then that relevant sales order information would go across to the fulfillment team. The fulfillment team had two main tasks. First, they were physically shipping a DVD. So we had to keep inventory or we had to burn the DVD or whatever. Physically shipping something to the customer. And secondly, they went to a separate system called WPS where they would you know, process the order manually. They would generate license keys and, and do a number of other steps manually, and that process would, would then send an email with the license keys in the email, so in an attachment of the email to the customer. And then once, all, once both of those steps were done, someone would manually go back into our Oracle system and close the line item so we could recognize revenue. What was the uh, average uh, fulfillment time? I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't planned, by the way. <laughs> I don't have a precise metric, right, but go. we said hours or days, Sorry. right? So depending yeah. on how busy fulfillment was, it would take a few hours to get that in their backlog, right. to go to the system to do it, and then days if you think about the, the shipping time to the customer. Right. So from the time the customer got, placed the order to the time he or she received it, we're talking days. Um, and the fulfillment mechanism was primarily manual, other than the automated email. There was a person kind of pushing the levers and behind the scenes. Yep. Revenue recognition, hours or days. Licensing security was low because we're sending that license key in the clear in an email. Um, customer self-service, none. They're purely a recipient at that point, and we really have no visibility or insight into whether they've received the, the goods and whether they're using it or how they're using it. Got it. Considering I built the slide, I should have known my own answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so right. Dave, would you like to do it take Yeah, after? okay, I got the next one. All right, so um, can you build out one more click, please? All right, so the uh, new components into the system, uh, item A on the left is uh, the team built their Sentinel RMS license enforcement into the product itself for additional security. Uh, B, which is the big one, which is Sentinel EMS, our enterprise back office, uh, we actually run that as a hosted service by our managed services team. Um, and uh, the thing that kind of makes the, everything uh, work as far as automation is item C. So we have a uh, integration with Oracle. To be fair, there's uh, IBM cast iron in the middle, so we're actually integrating um, uh, the, the middleware with EMS and Oracle talks to cast iron. Uh, we see that's a pretty common type of configuration, either Oracle talking directly to EMS or through some other um, middleware like B2B or cast iron. So entitlement uh, goes into EMS, and then uh, the customer automatically gets the email, so there's no person in the middle, and then the customer would uh, do their activation through our customer-facing portal. Right? So, oh, and then for downloads, um, we've used Akamai in the past, but uh, it was important that it get integrated into the overall solution. So EMS has an integration with, with Akamai 
uh, so the customer can use the portal for both downloads of the software and the license activation. Okay? Yeah, so the business impact, and when we compare the previous to the, to the post, um, the fulfillment mechanism is 100% automated, including closing the line item in Oracle. So the order gets booked in Oracle and not a single person touches it um, at all, and the customer gets what they need. So much, much more scalable than the previous solution. Fulfillment time is minutes, just because there's some, some back office processes that have to work, um, but minutes, not hours or days. Revenue recognition, again, minutes, higher security, um, customer self-service, and we have insight now. We can see if the customer has received the product. Hey, Question? Chris. So now the email doesn't contain the license keys themselves. Okay, the question was what changed in the email that made it more secure? Previously we were activating on behalf of the customer basically and sending the license string to the customer in an attachment. Now what we're doing is just creating the entitlement in EMS, sending an email with instructions for the customer to log into the EMS portal, activate themselves at which point the license string is generated on the fly. Okay. All right. Did I, I think I covered all of that, right? Yes. So yeah, the, the other key is the, the closed loop nature. So now we can see when someone logged in, what they did, and so on and so forth. This was a pretty simplistic example, but you know, um, at least knowing that they received it, that they're using it, and then you can build on that with more complex you know, usage and so forth. This particular product didn't require that much business intelligence, but at least closing the loop was a great step forward. Okay, I think we have a question over here. So from a, from a customer experience perspective, what was the feedback from getting what I need and activating my product, which is something now to go to a portal to get something generated for me to go to execute? Was there any perception from the customer to go through that two-step process instead? So far, no. Um, although we can see the next, so in this particular, this particular customer base typically isn't in any kind of a connected environment, so it, it did require that manual step for a customer to go himself or herself to log in, get that. But there are connected ways where that can all happen in the background automatically, so that's the most desirable. But in this, this particular customer base, most of the time it's an isolated environment type situation. Okay. Cool. Okay. So. Next up, we just wanted to talk about with this, as I mentioned before, we took an approach, we used SMC as a, a trial, we had a couple of other similar case studies and really saw good results. So that momentum, that, that positive momentum that we saw resulted in this recognition that we need to do more of this um, and the, uh, the virtual products team was born. The virtual products team really is just, what, four or five months old. Um, I'm, I'm new to the position, not new to Jamalto. But there was a recognition that this stuff is good, we need to do more of it. So we've created a team. Um, myself there, Raj Bhagat and Yo-Yo are in the audience over here, if you recognize those faces. Um, all, we're all working together to do more of this kind of stuff across Jamalto. And then we have an open headcount, a solution lead. Really, we've been, we've been, how can I say, leveraging or borrowing expertise from Dave and many others in the software monetization world to fill this need. Eventually, we hope to get someone with the, you know, the, the uh, software monetization, the Sentinel expertise dedicated to our team. But we don't have that yet. Yeah. We're I, making do. I keep asking, what are the hours? <laughs> <laughs> OK, and so we've created yeah. a mission statement um, to streamline our virtual product offering. So I, that's the first part, streamline the offering. Instead of letting all these pockets do their own thing in their own way, let's, let's try to bring them all together and streamline the offering. So we're solving one problem one way instead of many ways and uh, improve uh, customer experience, internal and external. Okay, I think the next slide's mine. Yeah. Yes. All right, good. Um, yeah, so it's not just a change within operations. Uh, Mark, Siri talked about, you know, um, you know, it's a philosophical change within in Juniper to embrace software and to think differently and so forth. Um, and when, again, when we do customer engagements, if you look at kind of the 12 o'clock position here, around policies, there tends to be, when, when a, one of our customers tries to embrace uh, uh, our solution as a new platform, as a new way of doing business, with it comes the uh, onus of, of putting together the right policies for your company and to make sure that you have standards and make things easier for your product teams to consume, uh, to be your internal customer, if you will. 
Um, we did an engagement in, uh, it was in Denver just a few weeks ago where uh, one of my guys did the quote unquote workshop for a whole day and I was you know, sitting there taking notes and I came up with about 28 policies that they need to decide themselves internally before they, you know, what I felt was, you know, they could really go to market with, with something that was, that was uh, a standard across their offerings. If they bought two different products, did they get the same email? Uh, if they had bought if they had a customer having two different uh, product uh, evaluations, are they the same trial period? Um, you know, what happens when a trial expires or a subscription expires? Does the software stop working? Do they get an error message? Again, if they have two different products of the same company, do they get consistent experiences and so forth? So, you know, the policies uh, is just an incredible, uh, uh, tool that you can use to, to drive consistency and drive a better customer experience. Okay, and I think you want to talk to a couple of the others. Yeah, right? just, just that, you know, as you said, it all starts with the policies deciding what you want to do, and that can feed into then the infrastructure that's built. We, we show the diagram of kind of what our back office systems are um, and the guidelines that we're going to try to follow. And then those guidelines are adopted, hopefully, by the product design team so that we're designing our products fairly consistently across across product families, um, then that feeds into a much smoother NPI. We don't have the situation where the design team is kind of throwing things over the wall to operations and hoping that you know, they find a way to deliver it. They're designing the products in a way that they know operations can deliver because the infrastructure and guidelines have been built as such. And then the NPI leads to um, you know, the product launching and meeting market requirements. And then the, it becomes cyclical because obviously uh, market requirements change. So what meets market requirements today may not do so tomorrow. So we're counting on the fact that our, that our marketing team and others are looking at the market and telling us what's changing. And then that will change the policies and it will evolve from there. OK, so that was where we are today. And then we wanted to just give a quick look about um, where we're going next. Um, here's where our, our customers are taking us to next. Usage-based billing, we've heard that many, many times today. Everyone wants to move to our, uh, an OPEX versus a CAPEX model, away from perpetual licenses and more to uh, subscription or usage. Um, low friction product trials, we heard about frictionless or low friction, especially we're seeing that in product trials. Right now, or historically, our, our trial policy has involved customers you know, signing a lengthy evaluation agreement and Less setting them up in our system with you know all these terms and conditions and um, you know financials and so forth, they don't want to do that. They're just I just want to go to a website. I want to click try and and do it. So we, we need to make sure we have a good process and consistent process for that. Expanded self service capability. Now that we have the portal, customers can access it. They can see what they own, how much they you know how much they've used, and they can even do things like transfer locked licenses from one asset to another. And then online ordering is, a, is another area. So those are the main, main areas that we're looking to in the next year or so. That's our next poll question. I think the poll questions is similar to some of the ones we had before. But uh, which of these are the highest priority? Subscription, usage, more self-service, low friction trials for try and buy. And then, uh, of course, the self-service portal. Yeah. There we go. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty rare, uh, extremely rare that we talk to a vendor these days that doesn't want, that doesn't really have an interest in usage. You know, my personal uh, opinion on it is I think some of the technology is ahead of the business models with usage where, you know, maybe traditional device manufacturers aren't quite sure how they're gonna monetize on that data. Um, but the first step is, you know, kind of looking at our technology to make sure that uh, they can get it uh, so they can start to, you know, see the possibilities and then start to build a, a business model around that. Okay. Nobody likes trial wear, I guess. All right. Okay. It's a wrap up. So a few recommendations we wanted to leave you with based on our internal story. First thing is get executive sponsorship. We've been lucky enough to have our execs, you know, kind of uh, bless this from the beginning and continue to support us. So I would say getting executive sponsorship, sponsorship is absolutely fundamental. Um, sure, I'll second that one because, uh, you know, prior to SafeNet working as uh, a software provider, if you didn't have executive sponsorship, nobody really wants to play in this pool, right? It's, it's, sometimes it's hard work and it needs to get done and without executive blessing, a lot of times it won't. 
but as a, as a business consultant, I think one of the questions I get asked the most is the second item, right, is who owns this thing, right? And without somebody tasked with owning the entire customer experience from end to end, um, you may find yourself in a tough spot, right? Or let me flip that around. We have some, uh, some customers who the, the best run programs that we have are the ones that are well-funded, right, and, and have an owner internally, right? So that's somebody, again, that owns a customer experience from end to end. If it works, great. If it's broken, it's their fault. <laughs> Uh, thirdly, uh, establish standards. So uh, we talked about policies and, let's, and just making sure that we don't have, that you don't have you know, pockets within the organization that are doing their own thing, that there are some clearly defined standards and that people are, are adopting those for the most part and exceptions are truly exceptions. Yep. Um, last one, we talked about customer experience all day. The example that I think we showed here last year, which is a great one, where uh, HP, before they moved to, um, to our solution, they had a customer satisfaction rating, which is over 50%. And then when we, we worked with them, we really worked on customer experience and tried to hide some of the complexities and that uh, within six or eight months, their customer satisfaction rating went up to 80, 84, somewhere in there, 86, 84. It was significant, right? And then lastly, just get industry help. There are resources available, many of them here. Um, if we tried to do what we've, what we've done so far alone, we wouldn't be I wouldn't be sitting here today. So definitely get help um, from, from the experts. That's it. How are we on time? More questions? Time? I think we're ahead of time, right? Okay. Any questions? So just to clarify on the last slide, standards equals policies, or when you talk about standardization, is that a process? Or so I would, I'll give my answer and you. Sure. I was thinking, Somewhat interchangeably, policies I would think of kind of a little bit maybe one level higher, like you know corporate policies or, or departmental policies, policies or whatever. Standards I would say similar, but maybe I think of standards being one level below. Like like Dave said, you know if a trial is going to be a 30-day trial, let's try to make it 30-day trial across the board. That may not be a policy, but to me that's a standard. Yeah, that's agree. That's about right. Yeah. Other questions? Chris. Sure. That's in the tomorrow section. Maybe your product managers have a solid grip on that or something, or the, or the products don't lend themselves to, to that. But is that something you either? Yeah. Yeah, so I think you're, he's asking about, um, you know, getting usage information or business intelligence or the features and functionality, right, with products, and he didn't see much on there. So in the SMC use case, you're right, um, it's, more, it's a perpetual license and it's kind of you buy it once and you own it. Um, but yes, we have other use cases that aren't complete yet, maybe there'll be one next year. We definitely are looking at um, additional use cases where there's individual features customers can buy, you know, and or buy access to all of them, and then via activation data and EMS uh, reports, we would get a lot more intelligence as to how they're using the product. I think I saw another question. Yeah. Vince. Where does your group sit in the broader Jamalto organization, and how do you work with the separate divisions? So I'm part of uh, yeah. IDSS. Okay. Repeat the question. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Where, where does my group, the virtual products team, sit within the overall Jamalto? So we are part of uh, the operations team for our IDSS division. There are, I don't know. Four. Yeah, Identity Data Software and Services, that's IDSS, thank you. There are maybe three or four major kind of divisions under the mother umbrella of Jamalto, so we're part of one of those, and I report into the, the head of operations. And your scope of coverage is within that business unit? Yeah. Yes. Across the business unit? It's within that business unit, but that business unit has many smaller business units. And then, and I will say that since this role was established and I've kind of gotten involved with some of the teams under this IDSS business unit. I've also had some requests come from other ones that aren't technically in my sphere of influence, but we're trying to kind of help out and spread the word as much as possible. Okay, any other questions? I think we're okay.
Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.